Welcome to the Gruber Morning Show podcast. I'm Pete Gruber. I'm Mark Schaffner. Good morning and welcome to the podcast. We've got a great show for you today. Got a lot of things to cover. And it looks like we already have a comment. Uh, one of our uh, visitors, Ray Johnson from uh, YouTube. How are you, Ray? Um, he uh, apparently saw the, um, uh, the Monroe Live podcast, which came out this morning. Uh, where Sandy and I are just kind of reminiscing about, uh, you know, industry uh, issues and uh, even our personal backgrounds. There's some commonality there. Um, and what Ray says, he says, twin sons of different mothers. Well done, gut gemacht, which means great job in German. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Sandy's um, from the, um, or his family is from the Black Forest region. And... Um, I'm from um, actually Bavaria, but I have an aunt uh, that um, uh, that lives in the Black Forest region because that's where my uncle is from. So we have a lot in common regarding food and uh, a, a, a appreciation for fine Bavarian beers. And uh, the other thing that was um, that we talked about was uh, our backgrounds in terms of coming from poverty, uh, as uh, Sandy put it, cash deficient. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, I can't wait to see that particular podcast, Pete. I, I know it came out just this morning while I was doing show prep, and uh, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing that. You know, you didn't know as a kid growing up, uh, you, per, you always ate organic, locally sourced, no, no uh, additives, no preservatives type of food. You, you actually were eating the uh, healthiest and most expensive food that's available on the market today. Today, yeah. yeah. But uh, like you, uh, we didn't think about it. It's just uh, you know you're raising cows in the summer so that you can butcher them in the winter so you can have your uh, so you can have meat. You yeah. you have a garden uh, for us. We had a big garden. Mm -hmm. um, and if if you don't weed the garden, you don't get as much food in the winter time. So you That's have true. to weed the garden all summer long. <laughs> and then the canning process. Remember that all oh, yeah. your surplus then went into cans and uh, or into um, um, yeah the canning process. And then you had a root cellar where you stored all of that. And yep. uh, yeah, as Sandy said, uh, if we didn't grow it, we didn't eat it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> but yeah, it's a it's a, a fun uh, video to watch. Uh, the Monroe team is definitely inspirational. Everything they do, and uh, we always have fun when we get together. One of these days, Sandy promises he's going to come out here and uh, see our oh, the um, the auto shop of the future. And uh, when we uh, when he does, we're going to go to a German restaurant down here and enjoy some Hefeweizen, which is a fine Bavarian wheat beer. You know, today's show, I think, is going to be one of the most exciting we've had uh, in, a, in a while. I can't wait to see uh, one of our main articles that we've got here. It, well, I think we're going to have a lot of fun going through that. Yeah. Uh, everybody, keep the questions coming. Tell us where you're coming in from, and uh, we'll, we'll entertain and interrupt uh, what we're going through as, as the questions come in, and uh, just have a good time here. Yeah, so the topics start with 10 ways Tesla has reshaped the automotive industry. And it is really a remarkable rise to success within the span of a decade. You know, this unknown company came out of left field and uh, just uh, changed everything in the automotive world mm -hmm. when you had incumbents that had been around for a century that weren't able to do anything like this. So, but some of the things that, um, uh, that this particular article uh, talks about is that um, we currently are in the middle of an EV revolution. It's in full swing, and everybody wants a piece of the pie. Yeah. Uh, and almost too late because many of them said, now nah, this isn't going anywhere. You know, GM, for example, had the opportunity to own the EV market in the last century when they came out with the first real electric vehicle, other than the bakers and the things that right, you know, right, ended right. way in the last century. Um, and as the CEO pointed out, there, you know, there's no future in this. Uh, this is this is not viable. So they crushed them all. And here comes Tesla, struggling with trying to make that Tesla Roadster profitable, so that they could continue to grow their company. And they just barely made it. I mean, just barely. They were founded, by the way, in 2003, and it was Mark Tarpening, Martin Eberhardt that um, uh, that incorporated uh, as uh, Tesla. And um, a half a year later or so, um, here comes Elon, and he joins the company as a financial investor. Mm -hmm. 
Um, initially, he thought, well, these guys will run it. I'll just throw some money at it and, uh, you know, let this thing continue to grow some legs. And then eventually, Elon got very involved in the company. Um, <clears throat> but they, they actually, uh, you know, brought a lot of innovation to the auto world, which has sent ripples throughout the international auto industry. And it's not just in the U.S. Um, they didn't release any vehicles, Tesla, until 2008. And, of course, that was the Tesla Roadster. And they struggled with that as well. Um, it was um, a noble thought to take a Lotus Elise car body and electrify it. Sure. And use the T zero or the uh, what was um, uh, the company is actually AC Propulsion's T zero drivetrain, which did not work out very well, and the um, uh, the Lotus project didn't work out well either. They ended up having to change the frame, change the body panel. Let's so, put some Lotus images up right quick. Yeah, let's do that. So today, only seven percent of the Tesla Roadster is um, a reportedly Lotus. That's why we have such a hard time getting parts. It would be nice if we could go to Lotus and say, we want a fender, uh, you know, we want a body panel. Uh, it's just not available because they had to change so much. And of course, that changed also the, um, uh, the cost projections on the car. Oh, yes. And they realized at one point, hey, we're selling these cars under cost. And everybody knows what happens when you have a company where your, uh, you know, costs are below what you're selling for. I'm sorry, above what you're selling for. Yeah. And uh, you're not going to last very long. But fortunately, Tesla hung in there. So the first item that they mentioned here is... Can I interrupt just sure. real quick? Let's tell uh, people why we have a plaid Tesla Model S in the background. Oh, good point. Yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> So the um, let me get back to the um, uh, the prompt that I was using to get this, and uh, the reason we chose this was because we wanted to follow with this uh, theme, which is that uh, Tesla really changed the auto industry. So here's the prompt that we gave AI. It says uh, Tesla Model S Plaid supercar showing in a fast sleek or shown in a fast sleek design to appeal to all the senses. Now, you have to get pretty verbose with prompts in order for AI to do its thing properly. So yes. that's, that's why all these adjectives are in this sentence. But anyway, it took it very literal, and we have a plaid Tesla Model S. Um, there were other variations of this, which are equally as plaid. Um, so that's one thing about AI. It's going to take you very literal at times. But we decided that that would be our background because we're going to talk about Tesla and um, some of the innovations that they brought to the industry. So um, anyway, Tesla has managed to bring EVs to the mainstream before anyone else, of any sizable magnitude at least. Um, during the infancy, um, at one point, EVs were considered nerdy and uncool. And I know this well because I... Um, uh, my wife and I own two uh, Toyota Priuses. So you had the privilege of owning what might be the ugliest car ever made. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> and for a guy like me that's into sports cars and uh, muscle cars and, uh, you know, I had an ACR Viper, for example, uh, these types of exotic cars, it was tough for me to, to uh, drive a Prius. But that 50 miles per gallon during the, the, you yeah. know, the gas problems, yeah. um, that was the overriding factor as to why it made sense for us and our family. Um, but yeah, at, at uh, one point, EVs were considered nerdy and uncool. And it's, you know, this is reminiscent of my high school years. Um, we had two, two grades of people. Mm -hmm. There were the jocks and the cool people, and then there were the nerds, you know. And uh, the nerds never really got much traction until Huey Lewis came along with a song called It's Hip to Be Square. And suddenly uh, yes. it became cool to be a nerd. And then, of course, you had Bill Gates, for example, you know, that, um, uh, that came along. And uh, many other techno geeks that really legitimized the whole concept that, you know, maybe these guys are, uh, you know, mainstream. Yeah, it's okay because nerds are rich. <laughs> exactly. <what> <laughs> yep. Nerds definitely did better than the uh, class that uh, we thought was cool during my younger years. But so... 
It turns out that the Tesla cars now have graced the screens of movies and TV shows. Um, there was a segment that we did a couple, three weeks ago, uh, a uh, cool was, show on yeah, Netflix. Suits. suits. Yeah. And uh, there's an Arctic white Tesla Roadster in there that looks really cool in amongst the Lamborghinis and McLarens and the Ferraris in that yeah. exotic car uh, dealership. So, um, yeah, suddenly EVs became cool. And uh, well-crafted design, high-tech features well beyond what you find in the ICE cars, practicality, and lately, straight-up value for your money. You know, we're getting close to the tipping point where EVs are going to be the same cost or even less than an ICE vehicle. Um, yeah, you know, I and, and if you think back, I, I did a little bit of looking and said, okay, what kind of cars were out there in 2013? Mm -hmm. That's when the Model S was really starting to gain traction uh, that had electricity. Oh, there were only a couple of EV models. Uh, it was Nissan Leaf, came out in 2010. Um, Chevy with their uh, Volt. Volt, yeah. It had come out by then. So little small sedans that were underpowered on the, on the engine. Uh, didn't have a very big battery and had about 90 miles of range. They were they were city city drivers. Yeah, and they looked like a Toyota Corolla. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, or a Toyota or a Toyota Prius. Mm -hmm. Or a Prius, yeah. And uh, and almost all the cars were hybrids. And even then, the hybrids, uh, well, you did have a Chevy Silverado hybrid pickup. Well, that was kind of cool to look at. But most of the cars that were even were hybrids, there was this stereotype of. Uh, electric is going to be small hatchback, two door or four door with 90 miles of range. Mm -hmm. And then Tesla came out and said, no, we don't want to just build the best electric car. We're going to set out to build the best car. Mm -hmm. And they did. Mm -hmm. They came out with the, uh, well, the Roadster first, of course, mm -hmm. and uh, with 200 miles range. That was substantially different than what everybody else was doing. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of innovation at Tesla. They realized that there was a thing called range anxiety. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, too, um, which um, was a deterrent for most people getting into electric vehicles because they knew that with, uh, you know, a full tank of gas, they could go, you know, a couple, 300 miles or so. And that became the benchmark uh, that these EVs needed to meet. Right, right. You know, and it's uh, if... When you think about it, a 90 mile car, they say don't charge it above 90%, don't charge it below 10%. Okay, so you just take an 18 miles out of that 90 mile car. There's no charging infrastructure. So now you have to take uh, that now 72 miles and divide that by half. Your range is 36 miles from home because you have to have 36 miles to get back home. Get back, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's best case. So that, that was range anxiety. That is range anxiety defined. And it's a real thing. We've got a video out there going viral, a guy that actually ran out of juice with his Model 3 and laid in front of a supercharger stall to try to make sure that his car was going to be able to charge. That's right. <clears throat> so the second thing that they mentioned in this article that, uh, now this is Tesla again, they have sped up mass EV adoption. And um, as they point out, if someone told you in 2008 that in 15 years, the world's best-selling vehicle would be an electric Tesla, you would have laughed at them. Oh, yeah. Totally. Oh, yeah. No one would have expected that. But that's exactly what happened. The Tesla Model Y is now the highest-selling EV in the world, not just in the U.S. or Norway or, you know, these mm -hmm. other countries, in the world. And, um, and, yeah, there were EVs, like you pointed out, even before Tesla emerged, but none of them made a proper mark on the industry until the Model S and then the more affordable Model 3 and the Model Y arrived. Yeah, even when the Model S was out there and the Model 3 hadn't come yet, uh, Tesla at the time was relegated to the, okay, you're a Jaguar type of, of manufacturer. You're going to manufacture these really exclusive luxury high-end cars. You've got this Roadster car that is a, a sports car, and now you have this luxury sedan. But, you know, we're not going to really take you seriously. Right. Then the Model 3 came out and just absolutely has taken the world by storm because, again, Elon uh, is doing what people said couldn't be done. We're going to build a car for the masses. We're mm -hmm. going to build an electric vehicle that has equal to or better than specs to anything we've done so far, 
and we're going to build it at a price point that's affordable for uh, your general person to be able to buy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it didn't come seamlessly. Uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, just uh, an, an easy process. There was a lot of uh, painstaking uh, development involved. Uh, you know, um, if you've watched some of Mr. Musk's, uh, you know, podcasts or the interviews that he's been in, he talks about the fact that he slept at the, uh, at the Fremont factory during mm -hmm. the Model 3 launch. And it was yet again another time in their history when he felt they were close to bankruptcy because there were so many design challenges that had to be overcome, that had to be met. At one point, uh, you know, Tesla is very progressive. They, they, they definitely embrace new technology. But the lesson they learned from that Model 3 launch is that you can do that too quickly. You can over, um, uh, uh, well, over automate, I guess, with yeah. robots. Yeah. And um, so there were some lessons learned, and it was a painstaking process. But it seems like Tesla goes through these challenges and then emerges on the other end quite successful each time. You know, I'm going to put a tickler in for you and for Jesse on Sunday or on a future mm -hmm. Sunday. Uh, I've heard that, um, you know, the, these, these natural language AI engines, uh, chat GPT uh, is the biggest of them. Um, they're starting to learn information based on articles that they have published. Really? Okay. And uh, and the, the the press is that it's that they're it's breaking it's breaking the entire model because uh, if an AI generates drivel and then uses its drivel to generate more drivel, it just gets progressively worse over time. Totally. Yes. That sounds about like what happened with the Model Three. He tried to do too much too quickly with automation mm -hmm. and ended up with just kind of a mess. Yeah. And, you know, my biggest takeaway from watching Tesla go through their uh, rise to success, from failure to success over and over again, was a term that uh, I'm familiar with, perseverance. Yeah. And, uh, m you know, most companies, most people, most shareholders give up. You know, they bail. But uh, this company is completely focused on uh, proving that the impossible is possible, and uh, they won't stop at anything until they get there. Absolutely. No, Pete? Yeah. Just a real quick shout out back to that um, range anxiety video where that guy died in front of the charger. Mm -hmm. if anybody hasn't seen that, I urge you to go watch it. It just crossed over 720,000 views. It's by far our most successful video now. It's still just out there cranking away. It is amazing. And it's short. It's a quick watch, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting topic. Now, is that one, Jesse, just on TikTok or have we put it on our other platforms as well? No, this is on our, we're talking to, um, on our main YouTube. It is on TikTok. Okay. And it was definitely one of our most successful on TikTok as well. But uh, this is our main YouTube channel, Gruber Motor Company. Yeah, and it's, it's I don't know, a minute and 10 seconds long or something yeah. like that. It's, it, it's, it's a fun video, definitely a fun video. Uh, before we go forward, Paul Houlihan on YouTube has joined us uh, saying, uh, I'm enjoying your show from Ireland. So uh, good afternoon, Paul. We're really glad to have you join us. Definitely. And then we've got Instagram coming in, Prabal Pratap. Singh Rawat says, thoughts on Indian EVs like Tata, Nexon EV, or any Jaguar models? You know, we, we have not seen any in our service center, certainly. Um, not much in the news that I'm aware of. Uh, Tata, of course, has been around a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our engineers actually worked for them part-time, so we got some insights into the company. But um, I'm just excited, as I said in the last podcast, that there are other countries now and that they have some EV manufacturers uh, that are local that are beginning to focus on getting rid of fossil fuel burners. I agree. You know, I'm, I'm not familiar with the Jaguar EV models very much yet. I, I happened to cross an article where I, I learned that you could get a, a Jaguar XJ, which is one of their high-end luxury models, but they had discontinued it. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get a 2015 of those for about $25,000. Really? Okay. Uh, I mean, if for the price of like a Toyota Corolla, you can find a low mileage Jaguar XJ, 4.5 seconds, 0 to 60, 450 horsepower motor, uh, V8, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards, and they're the price of a new Toyota Corolla. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of uh, local to region EVs, have you guys heard about the uh, the island off of Africa that is, um, I forget the name of it, but they're making an EV and it's supposed to be pretty top notch. 
Really? Yeah, they're uh, they're calling it the Madagascar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Richard. <laughs> you have me Why? going there. <laughs> Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So one of the other items in this article is, um, and again, Tesla, point number three, it has greatly enhanced EV charging infrastructure. Um, a little bit of history there. Uh, the um, With the Roadster, it was very difficult to get a charge. And uh, one of our customers, Rafael de Mestri, who went around the world in 2012, realized that. Uh, but he was able to uh, usually tap into a circuit breaker panel somewhere and uh, continue to uh, you know, charge his car so that he could, um, he could continue around the world. This was not a hybrid right. where you had two options. You could get some gasoline to take you far enough to you know, charge again. But... Um, at that point, Tesla realized that in order for EVs to become mainstream, there are going to have to be fueling options as ubiquitous as gas stations. Otherwise, people just aren't going to uh, feel comfortable with the risk. And range anxiety mm -hmm. was definitely a big uh, you know, concern. So um, one of the, um, uh, so that was a huge detraction at that point to the EV uh, issue. And uh, Tesla began to, at their own expense, develop charging infrastructure. And uh, that has become the cornerstone of its transformation and the impact on the electric vehicle industry. And um, then they created the supercharger network, which then again altered the perception of EV's practicality by enabling rapid and convenient charging. And these are strategically placed along major travel routes within urban centers mm -hmm. to get rid of the dreaded range anxiety, which is the EV owner's worst nightmare. Now, to combine that with intelligent cars that are actually, uh, um, they are aware where the charging stations are, they will actually, um, they have algorithms that plot your trip right. so that the car tells you how far the next charging station is and whether you have enough juice to get there or whether you should go back and charge the last one and yes, you know, get yes. some more charge. But um, it has become um, uh, quite a bit different than the old ice uh, you know, fueling where you have gasoline pumps. Uh, and not only that, they have uh, on the navigation, they'll tell you where to stop. They'll tell you how long they expect that you're going to need to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't, they don't, uh, assume that you're going to have to charge fully every single time. And, uh, you know, for example, taking a trip to Los Angeles from here in Phoenix, I could plug in the navigation and it would say, stop at Quartzsite, charge for 45 minutes. Stop at Indio, charge for 35 minutes. Um, because I had one of the uh, shorter range batteries. Uh, and then, um, and I think that, I think, in fact, I think that was it. It was just saying, make those two stops. And then when you get to Los Angeles, you're going to, you're going to need to stop at one of the Los Angeles chargers because you'll be starting to get low. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that was incredible to see. Mm -hmm. And then in um, uh, the podcast yesterday, um, we talked about how Tesla now is beginning to upgrade the infrastructure at the supercharger locations. As you pointed out, if you go to California, you're going to be stopping in Quartzsite, mm -hmm. and there's a Carl's Jr. there for you to, you know, spend yeah. that 20 minutes or a half hour, which if you're not into fast food, isn't a great option, and there's really nothing else out that way. So... In California right now, Santa Monica, Tesla is going to be breaking ground on a diner combination drive-in theater with uh, uh, a retro-colored, uh, you know, diner coloring that kind of matches actually the superchargers, red and uh, white. And um, again, creating a full experience and something to occupy those EV travelers that are going to need to spend 20 minutes to half an hour at that charger location to get their charge. Plenty of things to do, plenty of things to see. You can watch a movie, you can go up on the, on the mezzanine and, uh, you know, see part of the city, see the screens, take your food with you, you know, all of that. Um, uh, do we still have a picture of that, Jesse? That might be worth throwing up because it, yeah, to me, that was pretty impressive. Yeah, it was. And you, and you know, and as we were talking a couple months ago about the NAX standard, uh, mm -hmm. what, what used to just be called the Tesla charger is now the North American charging standard. Um, we learned as well that Tesla, when they put out their supercharger network, they had gone to the Society of Automotive Engineers 
and said, we need, uh, this is back in when the Model S was being developed. So back in like 2010, we need some sort of a standard to be able to build a network so people will be able to get through their range anxiety. Mm -hmm. The uh, SAE came <coughs> back to them and basically said, yeah, we're working on it, but it's going to take about three years or so to build a standard. And Elon said, well, that's not good enough. Um, SAE collectively shrugged their soldiers and said, well, it is what it is. So he went and said, well, okay, I'm not going to worry about your standard then. I'm going to go do my own thing. Mm -hmm. And Sorry, what image are we talking about? You're, ta you're talking about the supercharger, right? Uh, uh, the yeah, drive-in supercharger, yeah. yeah. Drive-in, yeah. So, so a year later, you start to see the Trident connector. It had been developed, it had been tested, and it had been built out. Mm -hmm. And SAE was still... Uh, 18 months away from putting out what has now become the CCS charging uh, charging method that many cars, it's kind of like a second standard now. And, you know, the, um, uh, the initial program Tesla offered was not only creating a charging infrastructure, but also allowing people to charge for free if they have a Tesla, of course. Oh, yes. And uh, they felt that this would uh, accelerate EV adoption. Now, we all knew, uh, you know, out here in the business world that this was not going to last forever because there's a huge expense attached to that. You've got right. the leasing cost for the facility and the space that you're taking at those malls or whatever. That's that, um, uh, that supercharger is. You've got real estate costs, taxes, the cost of electricity. We ran the numbers one time over a year or so ago, and it was pretty substantial around the U.S. in terms of how much Tesla was spending just for this free electricity. Sure. Well, we all knew that it would end at some point, and it did, and they began to charge for it. And then we all thought, well, you know, they've got the infrastructure. Why not open that up to other EV brands? and begin to monetize this. And just in the last podcast, it turns out that Wedbush had um, decided that this, this uh, EV charging infrastructure developed by Tesla has the uh, possibility of doing 10 to $20 billion revenue per year just because of its size and its magnitude. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's going to be, a, a, I won't call it a significant portion of Tesla's revenue overall. They will... You know, the same researchers were saying that once they get to 2030 and they're getting between that 10 and $20 billion, that's probably only going to represent between 5 and 6% of their overall re projected revenue based on their growth estimates. But still, 5% uh, of uh, a company's revenue the size of Tesla or maybe, you know, the, the size of Ford or the size of General Motors. And this revenue, to me, the cool thing I just can't get over is... Every car that sells well benefits Tesla, whether that car is a Tesla or not. Or not, yes. Yeah, yeah good point. And um, <clears throat> you know, I think I likened it in the last podcast to Tesla being almost like standard oil, mm -hmm. where they're controlling everything. And of course, the second fear, we talked about range anxiety with this, with this um, you know, EV adoption, was will the grid collapse? Will there be enough electricity for all of these cars? We just got a question about that, yeah. We did, okay. And, uh, you know, we did a video on this a year or so ago. For those of you interested, take a look at uh, our YouTube channel. But um, we did the research and we found that the utilities have anticipated this. They're keeping up with the demand. And um, at this point, it does not appear the grid is in jeopardy. Yeah, it doesn't appear like that at all. Uh, the Richard, the, uh, Richard Flinke on YouTube is the one who has a question about some of this. Uh, where he says, how does Tesla technology get the high voltage AC 480 volt to rectify to match the voltage of the battery pack, which typically is 360 DC? Well, the, um, yeah, the supercharger locations uh, usually have a little utility area. It's about the size of a 20-foot C container or so. And in that portion of the building, usually under lock and key, you can't go in there, mm -hmm. um, they have AC to DC uh, power supplies. And, of course, they, um, they are usually using 480-volt AC because that's a more efficient way to get power to a high current drain like that. And what these power supplies do is they reduce the voltage to the acceptable DC voltage. They then rectify it to DC, and that's typically how it's done. And then it comes out of that great big, uh, I call it great big, but you're right. It's like a C container area. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they plow the DC underground anywhere from the 10 feet to a couple hundred feet to your chargers, and it comes out of the charger and into the car. Mm-hmm. 
And it's um, um, we talked about the reliability of these superchargers. Do you remember the percentage that uh, we I, found? I do. It was 99.95% reliable, the Tesla network in 2022. And it's the most reliable charging network in the world, right? Oh, there, by yeah. far, by okay. far. 99.95% ends up meaning that you have about four hours and 15 minutes out of every 365 day year where you have unexpected downtime. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's difficult for utilities to have uh, that much uptime. I was uh, mentioning in the last podcast, the utility company that, uh, that provides power to my house just because of storm outages here in Arizona. They tell me that over the last year, I was running at like 98.7% uh, electricity to my house. That's well below the 99.95% reliability that's at a supercharger. Yeah. Um, the, yes. The, uh, I just wanted to call out the chances of Tesla getting everything so perfectly well done the, mm -hmm. as the first manufacturer doing this. The chances of that happening are really small. This is the first charging network of its kind. They're the ones that are being chosen by all the companies as the standard. They're the ones that have the most reliable network. To get that right the first time really speaks to the people and talent that are at Tesla. Totally. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you pointed that out. And, you know, um, a lot of credit goes to Elon, of course, for being tenacious and persevering. But remember, in organizations like his, it's not one man that is doing all of this. There are legions of people, well, like in our company, yeah. very talented people that are making the magic happen. And usually the gift of management in those successful companies is their ability to recognize talent and team building and, uh, you know, keeping the machinery running, basically. You know, and they've, they've obviously got a team of people who know well enough of what it is that they're trying to accomplish that when they see something wrong, they're not going up four layers of management to get some sort of approval right. to, to do something that needs to get done. They just go and fix whatever mm -hmm. problems out there. Uh, that's the only way you can get to those kind of percentages. Yeah. Unlike the federal government where you have lots of layers and bureaucracy and uh, yeah. Yeah. Or most large companies in all truthfulness. Yeah. Yeah. That have migrated in that direction. Um, we've got an Instagram comment from Praneeth Nadella. And uh, uh, he or she says, love from India. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you, That's and good a... evening. Uh, George from uh, on YouTube is with us. He uh, says, good morning, guys. I like how Mr. Pete and Mark match their shirts to the background picture car. When he said that, yeah. It, it, it... And uh, it's, it's not intentional. It, it just kind of happened. Um, and then he says, uh, would be great if only Tesla key fobs let you into the Tesla theater diner building that would keep out the non-Tesla EV owners. Well, <laughs> you know, we, we anticipate there will be a lot of non-Tesla people at, uh, this, uh, diner, uh, uh, a drive-in combination, and I'm really hoping that uh, this becomes a trend and that uh, the fueling stations become, uh, you know, theme-driven like this particular one is. And you could even do different themes. I mean, this one is a 50s diner combo. But uh, let's make it interesting. It doesn't yeah. cost that much more, and it makes it much more enjoyable experience for the for the um, uh, the owners of EVs. Oh, absolutely it would. I think the different themes would be great. Uh, on TikTok, Weston Charm has a question for us. Uh, first, good morning and glad uh, that you joined us. Mm -hmm. His question, the grid is already stressed. How is it going to handle this expansion? Also, he says, there are leases that are delinquent. I've been on properties that have disabled the chargers. Hmm, interesting. I'm unaware of any decline in chargers. Um, we actually had a great guest a year or so ago. It was one of the representatives from a local utility here, um, APS, Arizona Power Services. And um, she gave us great insights into the types of, um, well, first of all, what the utilities are aware of in terms of future needs as this EV expansion is continuing mm -hmm. to accelerate, the steps that they're taking. And uh, we were very impressed with, uh, with that interview. Yeah, that video we did also had the um, Engineering Explained. It was a massive YouTube channel that we pulled a lot of our info from. Late, this was later on after that podcast with Heather. But mm -hmm. um, I think people see the sensational grid stuff about California and what's happened in Texas over the years, and they just apply that nationwide, which isn't the case. 
Well, you know, if you think about it, uh, we're very close to California, uh, but um, it's it uh, seems that things have quieted down in California. Do you remember a few years back, rolling right. brownouts? And we're in a critical power business, so when this happens, our equipment that we have service agreements on typically goes down. Oh, yeah. Because if you have a power outage somewhere, yeah, that UPS can carry you on batteries for maybe 7 to 10 minutes, and then if you have an engine generator connected to it, you get a longer, uh, you know, right. ride through. But um, our, um, yeah, our involvement in those types of issues has actually decreased, and it looks like even California is improving their grid. Yeah, California and Texas have both improved. And the guys uh, have told us in the past, when they did the research for the video about the grid, uh, we went into this believing the, the myth, mm -hmm. as it were, believing very much that the grid is stressed, it's going to get worse. How are we going to handle it? And what they found through the research was actually quite the opposite, that the grid is robust and not stressed in the way that we thought it was. Uh, and the build out of new capabilities on the grid is actually going faster than the increase in electricity usage is, uh, increase in demand. And, you know, there's, there's a shift in the revenue stream. It's moving away from big oil to the utilities. Yes, it definitely is. Uh, one of the other things that I wanted to mention, we're seeing more and more, are the supercharging stations that run on green electricity. Uh, they're uh, a large solar, uh, solar farm or a set of solar panels sitting above the chargers that help to shade the cars, generate electricity, put that electricity into some sort of a large battery pack like Tesla Mega Packs, and that way that, that, that charging station is able to power cars throughout the day and night, and they don't even necessarily sit on a grid mm -hmm. at all. Right. Yeah, good point. Um, all right. Uh, Nolvers uh, with YouTube. Nolver53 just woke up. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning to you. Uh, YouTube, Martin O. in Sweden. No, for every, I, and I'm assuming that you're in Sweden and that's not your last name. Um, yes. If I'm, yeah, if I'm wrong, let us know. He says, no, for every liter of fuel not needed, about one kWh is freed up for EVs. That's another great point is that uh, you know, the, the generation of electricity as a method of energy storage and energy conversion uh, tends to be more efficient than the generation of power to power wheels uh, in an ICE engine or an in, in an internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. uh, ICE engines are anywhere from 25 to 35% efficient. Electricity plants, uh, depending on the type, the least efficient ones run at about 45% and they go up to almost 60% efficient in their ability to capture that energy and get it moved along the line. Mm -hmm. And then George with YouTube is chiming in. He said the grid and today's EVs are like when Henry Ford built cars before there were gas stations and even paved roads. That worked out. It did. Innovation, uh, you know, yep. uh, demand drives innovation. It uh, creates infrastructure and uh, it brings all those businesses to the table. You know, I really think in another 15 years, nobody's going to be talking about whether or not there are enough EV charging stations for all the electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I think it's going to become one of those conversations where you say, yeah, you remember the day when, right? and that'll be about it. And, you know, let's, let's also remember that um, the majority of charging will eventually be done at home because we'll have solar on our homes. Yes. Uh, YouTube, Walt Tisler says, is it sunny? Uh, yes, that's one of the reasons we wear sunglasses. <laughs> Phoenix, Arizona is one of the sunniest places on earth. You know, there's, a, there's another reason why we wear sunglasses. Go for it, Richard. You know, we, we just so happen to have these wonderful sunglass case holders, right? You know, they're kind, it is kind of pointless without sunglasses. So, you know, we might as well wear sunglasses and put these in them or put, it, uh, put them in these. These are available on the website for $79.99 unless you use code Richard. And then he's looking off. over at Aaron to see if Aaron's <laughs> going to say, and you can also use code Aaron for the same thing. Uh, I, even have, I even keep mine up here so that we can see it on a regular basis. And then the Instagram viewers can see it right at the bottom of their screen because they cannot see me. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Okay. 
So YouTube Highlander, uh, he says, now at lunch, just checking in, and uh, P.S., kindness is still free. Thanks, Thank Highlander. You. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, YouTube, uh, Martin O. And I think Martin O is in Sweden because he used a metric measurement in the last comment. Yes, I think so. Uh, here in the U.S., we, we don't do that. Not yet, anyway. But anyway, he says kindness. It costs nothing. Sprinkle that stuff everywhere. You bet. We agree, Martin. On TikTok, iPhone House says hello from Mexico, or Mexico is how they would say it. Uh, with a burrito taco emojis. Uh, I love watching you guys. I study engineering me mechatronics in Mexico. Yeah, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and then George, uh, he's asking me a question. He says, Mr. Pete is Elon. Oh, Mr. Pete is the Elon of Gruber Motors. Mark is Franz. Oh, so you can be Franz von Holzhausen. I, I, I will yeah. be Franz. That's, okay. that's good. And then Richard Flanke says, no, Pete is the Tom Cruise of EV podcasts. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard. Um, and then Nolvers53 YouTube, uh, during the reveal for the Fisker Alaska, Fisker made comments to the effect that they had no desire to compete in the space full-size trucks. Do you see other EV brands following Fisker's path? You know, I do see other EV brands kind of following Fisker's path here. Uh, there is going to be a space for full-size trucks. Um, that space is quickly being taken by some of the legacy manufacturers. When you've got Ford and Chevrolet and uh, Stellantis for, for the Dodge Ram all going and putting out uh, electric vehicle versions of their full-size trucks. The main reason I see this is that Outside of Toyota and Nissan that have had limited success, and Honda's had almost no success in their full-size truck attempt, um, it's very, very difficult, it seems like, for foreign manufacturers to build a full-size truck that competes effectively with these three. And I'm talking about the ICE engine world. Right. Just um, probably more importantly, you almost never see full-size pickup trucks outside the United States, or at least outside of North America. Go to Europe, you'll never see one there. Yeah. The people, people there and in many places across the world feel that they're just excessive. Yeah. And so I think that uh, your EV brands are going to not necessarily go to the full-size pickup truck arena uh, as much as they are to other cars. You know, it would seem to me that um, in... Um, any new manufacturer would be heavily focused on attempting to create a mainstream product first to create the mm -hmm. ROI and then start to dive into niche vehicles once they have a revenue stream established. And it's tough, you know, mass transit, you have, um, uh, you have mass transit, you have buses, you have food trucks, you have semis, you have exotic cars like the new Tesla Roadster. Those tend to go on the back burner until a company finally has a product that pays the bills. Yeah. Um, and at this point, if I was going to go into EV manufacturing, I would attempt to, to focus on a low-cost EV that would begin to replace a lot of the internal combustion engine cars. Yeah, I, it's, it, it, it's been strange to see how many people have tried to copycat Tesla. Mm -hmm. You know, Fisker is coming out with the Ronin. Uh, Lucid came out with the Lucid Air. Um, you know, and, and many of the EV startups have been trying to go that route of, we're gonna put out some sort of a flagship, fancy, expensive car that we can sell a few of to prove that we can be out there in the world. But they're doing the me too thing. Mm -hmm. Tesla did it, so I can do it too. I, I, I would love to see more of these companies just chart their own path, figure out where they want to make the biggest impact and then try to make that. There are plenty of spots in this automobile marketplace for players to get in where there is not a ton of competition compared to the size of them. Right. And you know, as successful as Tesla is, um, I'm sure that they have some regrets. I'd love to be in the boardroom when they talk about those. You know, we shouldn't have really gone into this, uh, you know, like the Model X, for example. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? that, that's a great example. And some of these other EV manufacturers may be assuming that everything Tesla does is successful. Well, that's probably not the case, but... Um, 
It reminds me a little bit of the 1920s and 1930s General Motors and how companies across the world uh, decided that they were going to structure themselves like GM because GM is so successful. So if I if I look like GM, I'm going to be successful too. Right. And it, it wasn't the case. It's about the management and it's about the vision and it's about the uh, quality of work that the workers put in. Good point. So um, YouTube Highlander says, I was truly humbled when I went to Kroger's and the cashier said, Kindness is still free. It was mind blowing. Well, they must have known you were coming, Island. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Richard Flunky again uh, says charging on sunshine, parked in the shade, is the future model for the big goal. Driving on sunshine. Uh huh. Okay. I agree. Uh, George is chiming in. He says Mark's car is plugged into the grid right now, keeping the battery and cabin cool and trying to reduce the heat wave in Phoenix. <laughs> You know, it's actually not today, right now, because first, I have my wife's car. I have my Volvo uh, XC40. Okay. Uh, we had to have the windshield changed out recently, and it is at the windshield uh, glass company because they had to calibrate the camera. So okay. it's sitting in a parking lot, not plugged in, uh, not keeping the battery and cabin and rest of Phoenix cool right now. Well, it looks like LinkedIn. Jiminy Stack is with us. Welcome. How are you doing? He's a local uh, godfather of EVs and all things uh, alternative energy. Um, we're honored to have you as a guest. He says the superchargers and other DCFC with large battery and solar panels help reduce the grid costs and loads. Dateland is a great example of how all charging locations should be built. Now, Dateland is a community about uh, 130 miles from Phoenix. It's about 60 miles west of uh, Gila Bend on Interstate 8. Um, and he's right. That's a, it's a beautiful charging station over there. And I believe that they run a lot of it off of solar and off the mega packs, just like what we were talking about. Very cool. Instagram. Simo underscore L Arabic 91 says... Hi, guys. How can I become like you? Well, the first step is to get yourself some sunglasses. And uh, then from there, uh, join us on our podcast and uh, we'll, we'll make you part of the team here. That's right. Uh, YouTube, Mustafa Elgamel says that supercharger with solar panel setup can barely maintain one car supercharging. If one solar panel generates 350 watts peak, a 75 kilowatt supercharge, not even 120 or 150 kilowatt, will need 215 350 watt solar panels. Um, I, I understand what you're talking about, yet at the same time, um, you see that there are a lot of these uh, superchargers that are putting out just about exactly that. They're, they're, it, I, it may be that some of them are supplementing electric utility power with solar, but uh, I know that there are some of them that uh, are actually running almost completely off of solar, and they put their charge during the peak hours when they're putting more electricity, pulling more electricity from solar than the cars that are pulling uh, out of the stationary systems. They dump that charge into stationary battery systems. Sure. Well, you know, the thing that, um, uh, that I'm personally excited about is for those of you that have been around for a while is watching the um, technology uh, continue to improve at an exponential rate. And so solar and the density of energy available today will be substantially different in the next few years as it continues to improve and become more potent and powerful. Yes, definitely will. <clears throat> Uh, Nolver53 on YouTube asks, uh, is it blasphemy if I put my inexpensive 7-Eleven sunglasses in a Gruber Motors sunglass case? Richard, maybe you can answer that one for us. It is not. It's not about the sunglasses themselves. It's all about the case. It's all that matters. Okay. That's well, right. there you have Thank it. Thank you. There's the answer. YouTube, Mostava El Gamal says, we need more solar farms. Yes, we do. And uh, I'm sure that as the economics are there, that uh, that, will, uh, that will motivate more expansion. Yes. Facebook, 
Fred Satis, he says, greetings from Denmark, Europe. Well, thank you for joining us. Niles is usually with us, too, from the uh, from the Genome Institute, Bion Genome Institute from Denmark. And uh, although I haven't seen him this morning, if you're out there, Niles, someone else is here from Denmark. Yes. Uh, he continues and says, do you have any comments on the FSD activation of the Tesla HPC Dojo? and what that might mean for rapid iterations of the uh, ML model applied by Tesla. Don't have any comments on that. One of the things that was um, a fascinating new direction for these Teslas is their, um, with uh, full self-driving, their ability to communicate with each other and basically have a scout out there that is looking at the various challenges uh, to navigate the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And things like a stop sign, for example. Again, now this is this is typical AI. As one car learns something, all of them learn it at the same time. And that, I think, is a powerful technology that will definitely propel this. It's going to be, uh, it's, it's, it's a little scary. It's, a, it's very powerful. And the reason I call it a little bit scary is that AI has yet to be able to differentiate falsehood from truth yeah and so as bad information gets fed into the ai it accepts everything as uh, as fact just because it receives it or it sees it um it's it's not a whole lot different than people that used to say well it must be true it was printed in the paper <laughs> where we get into that deeper philosophical rabbit hole where uh there is no true and false it's all perspective yes yes um, let's see, let's go back here. Uh, George from YouTube says, talking about the Tesla service center diner picture and all of the Easter eggs in the picture. Uh, did you guys see the electric bicycles and electric motorcycle? Is that a hint of Tesla building two wheel vehicles? You know, there's, there's a whole, um, hidden meaning in this picture that I personally have not dived into, but I've been amazed at how people have begun to spot other things. Uh, we should probably run through a few of them. Apparently, mm -hmm. Joe Rogan is sitting there with Elon Musk in one of those little cubicles smoking a joint. Yes. Um, another one that, uh, in fact, George pointed out to us, uh, the clock and the entrance of the door is at 420. Right. Um, and then they said... And there you go. There's the picture. Uh, there's the clock. And then to, down to the left is them. Uh, and then to the left of the two of them was Jeff Bezos. Mm -hmm. And there's a uh, odd looking uh, guy standing by Jeff Bezos, actually by the car, kind of looks like a mannequin. Uh, and I wonder what that's all about. That's a Tesla robot. That's a Tesla robot. That is a Tesla robot. Okay. Yeah. Yep. That's, all a, right. that's a Tesla robot with a food tray held up serving, the, serving somebody on the car. Okay. Um, and, you know, and I, I even found Dodge that, coin. um, you know, we, we had the, on the, uh, oh yes, there's the Dogecoin dog. <laughs> how uh, do you pronounce that by the way? Doge dog. Uh, doggy. I think it's Dogecoin Doge. is how. Okay. All right. We'll go with Doge. Uh, you have the, uh, the U S fish and wildlife service logo and letters on the car there. Uh, you've got on the cyber truck, the don't panic, which is a reference to the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy as well as the name of the restaurant. Millie Ways is the re uh, restaurant at the end of time, at the end of the universe in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In fact, that's the, that's the title of the second book of that trilogy. And then someone told us what the acronym USFWS stands for. Yeah, that was remember? United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. And that little um, over by your left hand, that little yellow mark is the top of that logo of the Fish and Wildlife Service logo is what we were told. Okay. Okay. So lot, lots and lots and lots of things there. Yeah. Wasn't there a Twitter sign too or something? Oh, that's right. Yeah. So you know it's outdated yeah. because it's X now. So we need to get this updated. That's right. It's That's Twitter right there. Oh, there it is. There's the building. Yeah. Yep. So... Yeah, let us know what else you find in there. It looks like this thing is rich with artifacts that need to be discovered. And uh, uh, well done, by the way, whoever the graphic artist was that, uh, that came up with this. We showed a picture of what's actually at 7001 West Santa Monica Boulevard currently. 
and it was a rundown, boarded-up building that had an old, the remnants of an old sign, and it was a Shakey's Pizza at one yes. point in time. Yes. And of course, at this, yeah, there we are. And uh, very few people um, were able to pipe up and say, oh, Shakey's, I remember that. These guys here, of course, had no idea what that was. Right. And so on YouTube, Martin O. from Sweden, again, says, hum, I uh, saw a follow-up comment to the kilowatt per, per liter. Um, and he said, I wanted to clarify, it's like, it's more like refineries, refineries use a lot of electric power to make fuel. It's about one kilowatt hour per liter that they use to make fuel. As the need for fuel goes down, a lot of kilowatt hours are not needed for making fuel, thus can be used for EVs. Can be redirected. Okay, there yeah, you go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. And what we've predicted is as the... Um the uh, demand for fuel goes down. The cost for fuel will go up because a lot of the refineries have fixed costs that they need to meet, and uh, that will also drive EV adoption. So we're, we're not quite there yet, but that's coming as well. The, the back end of that fuel curve is going to have the same type of tipping point that the front end of the EV fuel curve has. Right, yep, there you go. YouTube, uh, Peter Pett says... Tesla also leads out with large touchscreen and over-the-air updates. Thank you, because that is actually the next topic here. You must have read our mind. He says, over-the-air is difficult for legacy auto because of the lack of vertical integration with their modules. Very true. Yeah. So I actually, yeah, into that. yeah, this is the next topic. Uh, Tesla, again, point four. It has popularized over-the-air updates. And they go on, they say, over-the-air updates for your car may feel like a foreign concept to many, but Tesla has managed to popularize that as well. Mm -hmm. They provide the OTA updates to ensure your vehicle stays current with the latest features. Checking for software updates is as simple as updating your phone. You can use your Tesla central touchscreen and download them through Wi-Fi. Well, one thing that I also added here, this whole concept of over-the-air updates or the car being connected, being a node on a network somewhere, has another uh, huge benefit for the manufacturer in that some of the, um, of the recalls that the vehicles go through will not require a trip to the service centers and downtime and scheduling and loaners because some of these things can be resolved with an over-the-air update. That's correct. I've actually seen that not only uh, we've seen that uh, reported with Tesla, I've experienced that with the Volvo. The, we have an EX40 recharge, so it's the uh, two-motor uh, electric vehicle, and they were having some troubles with some of the uh, charging and range, and an over-the-update uh, correction fixed that problem in its entirety. Amazing. Whole new world. And it, of course, it really is. Yeah, like someone pointed out, uh, you know, legacy ice can't do that. Um, all right. So one of the other things they mentioned here was Category 5. It has accelerated the advancement of self-driving cars. And, you know, they, they uh, correctly point out that self-driving cars have always be considered a thing of the future. And it turns out that Tesla's on the forefront of that as well. Now, they aren't alone in developing self-driving technologies, but its autopilot and full self-driving systems are arguably the most refined driver assistant options available so far. Now, they say the name itself is a bit misleading, and I, you know, I can attest mm. to this. My, when my P90D Ludacris was functioning with full self-driving, right? I used to take people for a drive, uh, visitors. We get corporate visitors often or just, uh, you know, general people that want to see our shop, the auto shop of the future. And invariably, I would take them on a Tesla Ludacris launch in that P90D. Um, and um, what, what would happen is even the people that came from corporate America, you know, serious, stiff-lipped, suited and all that, as soon as I got behind the wheel and I did that launch, they were stamping their feet and giggling like schoolgirls. It was that much oh, yes. fun. It's like a roller coaster ride. Um, but um, I would point out as we were coming back toward the office, there were a few lights. I would say, you know, it's not perfect yet. It does not see red lights and it will blow right through that light whether there's traffic there or not. 
And you can get killed in a car like this without that. Now, this was, of course, technology from a couple, three years ago. And I understand that FSD now has some additional features that might prevent that. But Yes, that it's it, it continues to grow and get better over time. Uh, but you're right. Uh, you know, there's nothing quite like you, you hit your turn signal. You're already in uh, autopilot mode. You hit your turn signal to change lanes. And all you have to do is tap it. And the car is going to effectively look around you to make sure that it's safe. And then when it's safe, it's going to shift lanes for you. And it's going to leave the blinker on the whole time. And you don't have to even think about it. It's, right. it's pretty cool. So the thing that I also added here was just think about how the world will change once FSD is perfected. And by the way, Elon's latest uh, tweet on that, I guess you can't call it that um, of that anymore. Post, I don't. The, yeah. the, the, uh, the latest post on X, yes. formerly known as Twitter. There we Did go. Did I say that right? All right. I think so. Um, he said that by the end of this year, he thinks that full self-driving will be a reality. Now, you know... Um, I just try and picture a world where we have cars that are driving themselves and you don't have to have occupants. If you need service, for example, um, the car can communicate with the Tesla mothership and say, you know, I'm having this problem. Um, do you have the part that needs to be replaced because I've self-diagnosed and I know what's wrong? And then the car could literally drive itself to the service center, get fixed. A loaner could be dispatched to that, to that owner's house mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it would be seamless. Or you could decide, you know, my car is costing me quite a bit each month because I'm leasing it, I'm making mm -hmm. payments on it. I'd like to offset that expense by turning it into a robo-taxi, and you simply send the car out to become available for other people to drive or be picked up or chauffeured or whatever. Now, I suppose in the, uh, with that type of a program, you could actually generate revenue. You oh, know, I think you could. Positive cash flow. Yeah. So not only is it making your payments for you, insurance payments, car payments, and all that, but you're actually beginning to, uh, you know, generate revenue. It, it's going to uh, really, really disrupt everything about the automotive, in, automotive industry, or even so much so as um, the car has an issue, reaches out to the mothership, the mothership says, yeah, I think I have a fix. It's going to be an over-the-air update. Go home, stay at home for four hours. Mm -hmm. It rolls out the update to the car, and boom, you're done. And you don't even know that your car had a problem. Mm -hmm. What's so cool about this discussion we're having is um, the technology is there, and we're a micro inch away from actually realizing the things that we just talked about. Yeah. Yeah. So a few more questions coming in. George says, what do you guys think of robo ice, um, ice cream truck that drives around your neighborhood? Yummy. Well, if it plays the jingle, I would say that would be fun. Yeah. That would be fun. You know, Peter Pett had actually said, uh, talked about two things, and we're going to get to that next one in a second. Uh, and the other, second thing he had talked about was the large touchscreen entertainment systems. Right. So uh, let's continue with questions and uh, and. That's we'll get through next. some of those, and then yeah. we'll get to the large touchscreen stuff. Yeah. So it looks like George is extraordinarily observant. He says, does Mr. Pete not wear a wedding ring due to working around battery electric all day? You know, George, you nailed it. And this was many years ago. I was probably 20, 21, and I was working on my buddy's 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner. And he was uh, non-technical, so he needed his battery replaced, the 12-volt battery underneath okay. the hood. Yeah. Now, remember, this is one of those hoods where once you open it, you've got massive amounts of real estate, lots of room to work, right? And the battery happened to be in the, in the uh, front right um, fender, right by the, um, yeah, you know, okay. the driver's side. So um, I got my uh, 716 um, uh, wrench out and... Uh, starting to loosen, um, you know, that um, uh, those two nuts on the battery mounts. And my hand slipped a bit, and I went down like this, and the my ring oh, caught oh. the positive end with the wrench on the other side, and that ring heated up instantly. Oh, my gosh. And uh, it burned my finger, of course. And, you know, from that moment forward, I never wear jewelry or never wore jewelry again. You'll find no earrings. You'll find no necklaces. There's nothing on my body that is metal from that experience. That's funny. I do, I do wear my wedding ring, but, you know, whenever I'm working on cars, I take it off because I have seen... Uh, the results of people who have gotten jewelry caught 
uh, in while they're trying to do mechanical work. They, you know, you, if your ring gets caught in something in a belt or something, you don't have a finger left. Oh no, it'll, yeah, it will take it right off. We used to work on uh, printers, line printers, when I worked for uh, digital and these were large, huge things, bigger than a washing machine. And, and they had large drums in them that would spin. And uh, we used to wear ties when I worked for deck and uh, the tie would come off when you're working around anything like that. Because if, if that drum caught your tie and yanked your body, your upper body into that drum, you know, you weren't gonna come out of that uh, without a lot of pain and injury. Yeah. Oh. Oof. Later on, Highlander also says, no self-respecting electrician wears a ring. Safety is all. U.S. taught me well. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Confirming that. Good point. That's right. Uh, on Instagram, KK Roy Adore um, uh, waves. Hi. Good afternoon or good evening, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, and then on YouTube, Sun Turtle Camper says, hello from Denmark. Uh, we need solar cells on the roof, not in fields that can be used for growing food or be a forest, unless the solar panels are put up over where you grow food. Good point. Uh, I, I think that's a great point. And uh, I, I, I know here in Arizona, we're starting to see more and more of that rooftop solar, or even better yet, the parking lot solar. Uh, there's a, a, a grocery store chain uh, here locally. It's called Fry's in the U.S. Uh, it's owned by Kroger Foods. And uh, more and more of their grocery centers are being powered almost completely by solar. Mm -hmm. And they're putting these massive solar arrays up in their parking lots to power their stores. You know, one of the engineers um, uh, that worked here years ago in our power services division had a brilliant idea. We have what's called the Central Arizona Project Canal, which diverts water from the Colorado River in California to all of the irrigation fields here in the state of Arizona. Without that, uh, we would not be able to survive in the desert. Correct. The, um, the evaporation rate of that canal, which runs about, what, 300 miles or so, mm -hmm. is enormous. So his idea was, since they have locks every few miles or so, that have that are connected to the grid to the utility to power the locks right why not put solar cells to cover the canal and then feed that energy directly into the grid at those lock stations and again like our viewer pointed out there's a um a symbiotic relationship there and that would be a win-win uh since it wouldn't uh, you know take any kind of land that would uh you know, absolutely. And in, uh, in California, it's starting to happen. There is a, uh, there's an aquifer that goes from central California down to Los Angeles because the, uh, uh, LA basin needs to get a lot of water from out, uh, outside of that basin as well. And uh, water evaporation, especially with the drought that California had over the last couple of years has been a big, a big issue. And, uh, and they're realizing that, the, the logic goes, people in Los Angeles are beginning to realize, or those who are experts, uh, that they can reduce evaporation enough to fulfill the water needs of Los Angeles for the foreseeable future if they can figure out a way to uh, cover that canal in a way that it still can be accessible. Interesting, yeah. And with solar panels and figuring out how to do, be able to do the maintenance on the solar panels, et cetera, et cetera, they've got engineers trying to figure that out. They've got about a 10 mile, I think it's a 10 mile stretch mm -hmm. of that canal now covered in solar as an experiment, trying exactly what your engineer was mentioning several years ago. And then one other thing he mentioned, which was also brilliant, um, solar cells eventually, especially out in the desert, you know, mm -hmm. will get covered with dust and dirt and it affects the, um, uh, uh, the amount of energy that they're able to generate because not as much light can reach the cells. Yes, certainly. So he said, why don't they put a pump with a sprinkler system on these, um, on these solar cells and guess where it's getting the power from? From the solar cell sure. and the water down below. So yeah, it, that um, that seems like a pretty efficient way to handle the um, uh, the evaporation problem. It, it definitely does. Um, there was even somebody in the last election cycle in Arizona that ran on a platform of we need to cover the canals. Mm -hmm. We lose almost sixty percent of all the Colorado River water that we get due to evaporation. And if we were to cover the canals in something such as solar panels, 
we could reduce that evaporation, cut it in half, provide enough water down to Phoenix out of existing Colorado River usage needs to completely uh, fulfill the water needs for everybody who lives in Phoenix today. Yeah, and let's not forget that uh, the mighty Colorado, by the time it gets to Mexico, is a tiny little creek. So That's we're right. using the majority we're, of that we're water. We're using water. virtually all of it. Hey, guys. Yeah. So I actually asked that question one time, and uh, the response I got was they're trying to figure out um, the quagga mussel issue that's in the Colorado River right now. So um, Pleasant, probably about a decade or so ago, um, had this invasive quagga mussel. And what it does is it, it reproduces in the shade, and it starts clogging up pipes almost like oh. a clogged artery. Yeah. And so they're worried that putting shade over the canal will lower the algae, but will spike the quagga mussels and potentially could clog a lot of the pipes um, going to and from the Lake Pleasant, uh, Havasu, um, and into the canals into Arizona, into uh, Phoenix. So I have another solution. What we then need to do is put French restaurants all along the canal because they eat, they actually eat those things. <laughs> Oh, wow. My son, by the there way, we when, go. We were, when we were in France, yes. um, he was toying with the idea of maybe eating uh, escargot snail, okay. yeah. right? And uh, you don't get many. You get like six on a little plate, right? Yes. Um, so anyway, uh, he did. He bought it. And my wife, who's French, would never eat it, she thought, right? So we coaxed her and coaxed her. And both of them actually ate some snail. Oh, wow. Now, okay. I think it's a one-time experience. You know, once you get that out of your system, I'm not sure that it becomes steady, uh, you know, diet yeah, for you. But, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they are plentiful. Um, on Facebook, Ingemar Anderson is joining us from Seattle. Welcome. Welcome, Ingemar. Uh, hi from Seattle. He says, I wonder what you guys think of Tesla's master plan to sustainability. He provided a link as well. So there's uh, an actual document on that. We're so going to have to read that link, yeah, because I'm unfamiliar with it, Ingemar. Yeah. I, know that, uh, I know that Elon introduced the Master Plan to Sustainability concept at the last investors meeting a few months ago. Um, we have not gone through it in detail as of yet, but that's something that we'll go through in more details and we'll uh, bring up on a future podcast. Instagram, Simo L. Arabic 91 says, I'm just new guy here. Are you guys repairing the EV cars? Are you like Brabus of the EV cars uh, when you upgrade them? Yes, that's a that's a great analogy. With the Tesla Roadster, um, we're we're specialists in that particular car, and uh, we're constantly um, striving to be like a Brabus, where we actually upgrade the car. Now we have to be careful with this kind of an effort because the cars are going to they are becoming collectible. And uh, if you do too heavy modifications on a collectible car, it becomes a clone car and it destroys its value. Right. But um, yeah, we, that is exactly what we do. We, we find ways to improve on the existing parts, things like uh, performance brakes. Uh, the Tesla Roadster is under designed regarding braking because they didn't anticipate a thousand pound battery in that Lotus Elise. So what we have is a um, performance brake system that actually improves um, the stopping distance. We uh, are now heavily involved in suspension upgrades. We are upgrading. In fact, let me show you something. Yeah, they. Uh... This is a uh, Tesla Roadster front shock uh, support bracket. And this one's been butchered pretty badly. This one came from another shop. And you can see there's some funky welds right here. There's a part here that's actually broken off. And um, what we're doing is improving these original parts. We have a machine shop here, which uh, is uh, full of programmable CNC machines, laser cutting machines, very high tech uh, type equipment. So it's easy for us to actually take an old design like this, enhance and improve it. Mm -hmm. And there's certain things in a collectible car that uh, you can change. Things like tires, for example, brake shoes, uh, shocks. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, so that's, that's part of what we do. So on YouTube, we have a solar car that's joining us. I believe solar car is a, a, a company or their own channel. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll entertain their advertisement for their video here. Uh, it says, dear sir, uh, no more EV fires because the EV anti-fire and lifetime reusable battery, its first video out of five, 
is going to be released on the 6th of September at the Solar Car Channel. Oh, very good. All right. Well, thank you for making that announcement. That's definitely one that uh, is that's, worth watching. I think it's going to be worth watching as well. So I wanted to give you guys that shout out and make sure uh, everyone here knows. Uh, give it a watch on the September 6th. That'll be uh, next week on Wednesday. All right. Uh, YouTube, Highlander, I remember Shakey's. Good pie, but I'm old. Uh, the pizza, yeah, primarily. Yeah. 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 It was a good thin crust pizza. And then, uh, yeah, the sauce wasn't too overwhelming. Yep. Uh, George from YouTube, uh, good question for us today. Uh, what do you think if emergency vehicles were mandated to have an electronic beacon that would let Tesla FSD cars know that they're there? The beacon would only transmit when the emergency vehicle lights were on. And then uh, I, I would assume then, of course, that would mean that the Tesla full self-driving cars that were in FSD mode would uh, slow down and pull over mm -hmm. automatically. I think that's, that's a great idea. It is, yes. It's a consideration I hadn't even thought of. What about 15 mile per hour school zones? FSD can read the sign, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Oh, uh, YouTube, Sun Turtle Camper, uh, we need the government and the market to both take up the challenge of making safe batteries that last 25 years plus, that can be put in every home, and then we can harvest the power of the sun. Noble strategy. Yes, I agree. Love the idea. YouTube, Highlander, no self-respecting electrician. Yeah, where's a ring? Safety is all. Uh, the U.S. Navy taught me that well. Yep. Yep. Uh, YouTube Highlander, he says, I had a 69 Roadrunner, Hearst Long Throw. I'm that old, LOL. <laughs> you know, after my high school buddy, uh, the one that I changed the battery for, he had one of those dark green 69 Roadrunners. It was automatic. But many years later, I was um, so smitten with that car at the time because he used to beat me all the time with my 63 Ford Falcon with a 144 cubic inch engine. Um, I actually found here in Phoenix a uh, yellow 69 Roadrunner with a Hurst 4-speed and uh, rebuilt it completely. At that time, I was actually able to send my Hurst 4-speed back to Hurst for a complete rebuild. Oh, wow. Um, but anyway, yeah, cool cars. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite an era. Uh, you know, there was a time in the 60s when um, you recognize cars immediately just from their styling. Right. And every manufacturer knocked themselves out to change styling every year. You would never see a Tesla Model S, for example, look the same for a decade. That just didn't happen back then because they thought that in order to continue to sell cars, you had to make it look different. And for a while, you had to make it longer and longer and longer. Right. So we ended up with 20-foot boats after a while, you know. But yeah, the muscle car era was a fun one. They were brightly colored, they were loud, they were fast, and they inspired us young guys. It was a great era of cars. I, I came in very end of that muscle car era, and I was, uh, I have to admit, getting, getting to driving age, my first car was a 1973 Chevy Nova. Yeah, uh, okay. Three speed on the column, I uh, love that car. It was, but that was at the very last end of the age. Uh, one of my neighbors had a 1970 Javelin. Okay. And, yeah. and I, I just, I loved the look of the car. I thought it was such a cool looking car all the time. He wouldn't take it out. He was retired. Mm -hmm. And he was a guy who thought that driving a car 55 miles an hour down the freeway was too fast and would hurt the car. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and here he is sitting with a 1970 Javelin in the driveway. And I'm thinking, right. oh, what a waste of a car. Totally. Uh, YouTube, Highlander says, go to Luxembourg, most pro-U.S. veteran country uh, on our Mother Earth. Oh, I did not realize yes, that. And I think that's a response to Sun Turtle Camper who asked the question, what do the panel think about free public transportation like in Luxembourg and the future of the EV market? Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, that's, that's an interesting concept. Uh, you know, here in the, here in the United States, especially in the Western United States, mileages are different. The culture is different than it is either in the Eastern U S or what I, what I saw in Europe or in Europe, especially. Yeah. Uh, you know, in Europe, especially you, you don't, you don't have vast distances that you have to think about here uh, to us here. Um, driving from Phoenix to Los Angeles to go spend a weekend, they, you don't think anything of that. And that's 360 miles one way. 
Mm -hmm. Well, 360 miles one way could get you uh, much of the way across France. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and so you're, you're going you're gonna to miss so much by driving 360 miles. You, you, the, those kinds of distances don't, uh, don't typically exist unless you're on some sort of a long road trip. Yeah. And oh. the nor uh, eastern United States is much the same way. It's also important to remember that there is no such thing as free. Right. When it comes to things okay. like this, somebody's paying for it. You're either paying for it up front or through taxes or something. So none of that's going to be free, except for kindness. Well, that kindness is 100% free. free. There is a second one. The Gruber Motor Company matchmaking site, Roadster Matchmaking True. Sales, is completely free. That's right. And kindness, like you said. Yep. That's right. YouTube, Highlander, he says, Fire X Class D. Fire Extinguisher. That was... Uh... Uh, oh, George had said on to Sun Turtle, there is also a lithium battery fire extinguisher that is just out now for lithium battery fires. Um, he says, I let Mark know of it. I, now, uh, George, I haven't seen that email yet, but that's probably because it's, uh, you know, I, when I get ready for show prep, I shut down my email and everything. I'd be interested to see how a lithium battery fire extinguisher would work yeah. because we know that lithium batteries tend to oxidize as they burn, which means that they build and make their own oxygen, which fuels their own fire. How would it extinguish? We're going to look yeah. into that. that. That's a good one, George. Thank you. Uh, YouTube, uh, George says it's Lion-X extinguisher. So yeah, for those of you interested, there's something for you to look up. Um, and then Richard Flentke says, look at that S car go. Oh, great one, Richard. Almost as bad. Us Richards think alike. There was a thud right after I read that, wasn't there? <laughs> I think the mic uh, dropped. Uh, YouTube, George again, made and designed just for lithium EV battery fires. Okay, we definitely have to look into that. Um, Nolvers 53 with YouTube says the transit system in the city of San Diego has a fleet of all electric buses. They're made by New Flyer. Have you ever heard about them? No, one of them just went bankrupt. Proterra, I think it was. Yeah, it was they Proterra made, that yeah. went bankrupt. New Flyer, I've heard the company name, but I think they've made uh, combustion engine buses for a long time as well. Mm -hmm. He says, actually, I think it's just two buses, but it's nice to see them on the roads. You know, years ago... Uh, when I was still able to get a hold of Elon, I sent him an email and I said, you know, we've got a tenant here in one of our buildings, the food truck builder. Mm -hmm. And um, I looked at those things because he actually built them from uh, chassis of, uh, uh, you know, like UPS trucks and uh, uh, campers, that type of thing. Yes. Uh, completely outfitted them. And there was a lot of electricity floating around in those. And I thought, this is an ideal candidate for an electric vehicle platform and then creating a food truck because of all the electricity that it uses. Oh, yeah. And um, I, I, I don't remember what his comment about that was or if there even was one, but uh, it still seems to me to be a good idea. Of course, it's a niche market. Remember, these EV manufacturers should not be focused on developing niche product at this point. To remain viable and in business, they need to focus on revenue generating activity. You know what would be interesting would be to see whether or not uh, when Amazon starts retiring its Rivian all electric vans, right. you could convert one of those vans into an electric truck, uh, electric food truck. Mm -hmm. And those are the types of things, those are the types of vans that are, are were being converted at times. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. All right, Ingemar says, uh, thanks, guys. Great show. Uh, thanks for joining us, Ingemar. Um, yeah, maybe we'll see you Sunday during the AI podcast. Um, YouTube Sun Turtle Camper says, the water used to clean the panels, and we're talking about uh, solar panels again, mm -hmm. um, to clean the panels would feed the plants growing under the panel. I hope that China will build factories in Africa to grow and make solar panels to take Africa into the future. That's a great point. And you know, Sun Turtle Camper, another thing too that the panels would allow, uh, if, they're, if they're adequately high, uh, I've seen this phenomenon here in Arizona, uh, plants don't always have to have direct sunlight to flourish. Mm -hmm. If you've ever lived in a home where you have a trampoline in the yard, 
your grass here in Phoenix will grow much faster and thicker under the trampoline under the tramp, yeah. than it will out in the sun. It kind of bakes in the sun, and the trampoline provides just enough shade and coolness to allow plants that are from a what would normally be a cooler climate zone to thrive in a hotter zone. The solar power is going to help in that area too. Mm -hmm. Hey guys, can you bring up that uh, thread just one click? We've got a YouTube comment from Kubi Nagenge, and he said, Hi guys, do you have any relationship with Tesla whatsoever? And he means, can you at any moment ring them up about any challenge you might face uh, repairing any of the roadsters? Well, yes, we do have a uh, wonderful partnership with Tesla, but there are different um, um, departments, different layers, depending on what the issue is. If, for example, it is a roadster repair issue, uh, it is bi-directional. We, we provide them with tech tips, things we're finding as these cars are aging, and oftentimes we can get information from them as well. Um, uh, and that took many years, by the way, to evolve and develop. It was a lot of pay-it-forward activity until Tesla finally realized, hey, these guys are helping us. You yeah. Know, let's yeah. give them a break. It took, a, it took a few years of pay-it-forward activity before we got much more than uh, this kind of swat and go away right. type of uh, attitude from them. But we get good cooperation from Tesla now. And then George says, does Mr. Pete remember the first electric car in his youth in 1832? <laughs> <laughs> ouch. Yeah, ouch. Not that old, George. And by the way, when did the first electric car came out? I had it on the podcast here. It was in the 1800s, but it was a bit later than that, I believe. I think it was a little bit later than that. More yeah. like 18, 1880 or so. Yeah. yeah. All right. 1890. 1890. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, we're still a bit kind of backed up on these questions. We might have to do a lightning round here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's... Uh, uh, first for George, uh, question says, can I get a refund on my kindness? No, kindness is always free. So, um, Sun Turtle Camper, YouTube, uh, money as debt, the best carton, uh, see it before your neighbor. I looked it up. It's a documentary called, oh. uh, uh, called money as debt. Okay. 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 Well, we'll look that, we'll look that up as well. Um, lightning rod. Hello from Thunder Bay. Hello, lightning rod. Glad you joined us today. And then YouTube, Sun Turtle Camper says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. Um, PL on TikTok says, in Finland, the official vehicle inspection may deem an entire battery of an EV to be replaced if it is dented. One guy lost 60K upon facing mandatory repair for a 120K car. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, we, um, from time to time, we get uh, requests from Tesla Model S or you know other Tesla owners, like uh, we did a Model X a while ago too, where the cars were involved in a uh, fender bender of some type. The mm. body shop did their thing, and then they realize, ooh, there's a puncture, there's a dent. Uh, you know, the battery didn't, uh, it it um, it did not survive, and it ended up with some damage. And sometimes a car runs, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So these cars, if they're at the Tesla service center, they're not going to be able to do anything for you. You know, they're not going to be able to plug up that dented hole. They're not going to be able to uh, uh, ignore that dent that's in the battery for safety reasons and liability issues. Right. Those cars typically will come to us. And what we'll do is we'll open up the battery pack and we'll verify that there is no damage inside that pack. And oftentimes, uh, you know, these cars go back on the road without an issue. Um, so, yes, just because a battery has either a dent or a puncture does not mean that it is terminally uh, ill and it's not going to recover. Uh, you even mentioned something uh, a while back about a guy that got had his roadster. Uh, he uh, Somebody in front of him dropped a pipe off of the truck or whatever oh, it was. Oh, number 500, yes, Okay, this was VIN 500, yeah. yes. And, uh, it, and it bounced up and it punctured through the, uh, the floor panel of the Roadster. Uh, he took it to insurance and they're like, oh, nope, not repairable. They totaled the car on him. And so he bought it, you know, got it back as salvage. And then what did he do? Put a, like a 12-inch by 12-inch plate 
Yeah, he took it to a sheet metal floor. shop. He got a piece of aluminum. They did, and they pop yeah. riveted on there to close off the hole, and the car was fine. The um, uh, the ruling from the appraiser was that the frame needs to be replaced. Well, of course, that's the entire car if you think about it. Right. You know, on a Tesla Roadster. Um, so again, it was a miscalculation and uh, erring on the side of caution to uh, uh, on steroids, unnecessary. Absolutely. The sad part about this particular case, though, was this was a collectible roadster. This was the last of the 1.5 roadsters. Uh, in the U.S., from 1 to 500 were the 1.5s, which are slightly different. Right. They have a stick shift and a slightly larger PEM. And then the 2.0 started. It was also a custom factory paint color. They painted this one in the Lotus copper color, which right. again makes it highly collectible because it's a one of, right? Well, it got a salvage title because of this, even though the owner was able to buy it back, put it back on the road. And then he tried to sell it years later. It went on our matchmaking site. And you know what? It took us nine months to sell that car. Because first of all, there's a very negative stigma attached to salvage vehicles. Right. Even though the absurdity of this was, hey, it had a little hole. It was the size of a softball, actually. And uh, it was repaired. Yeah. And, you know, there was no structural damage other than that. Nothing with the electronics. And, uh, but yeah, that, that's the story on that car. Wow. So... So that's uh, that, that's to me that was a, a one a, just an egregious story, kind of like the, this thing in Finland. Mm -hmm. um, a, a single dent in a battery pack causes the battery pack to be long, gone forever. Oh my gosh, that's terrible. So uh, Highlander on YouTube, I'm a Buchanan. We call each other for free globally: uh, Aziz, uh, New Zealand, India, South Africa, Mexico. We're global. Look us up after 340 years. Clan Buchanan is back. Okay, well, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, a lot of history there, it sounds like. Yes. Um, so Lightning Rod with YouTube says, Hey, a friend at Watch, Re um, Watch Rich Rebuilds channel is really George Car Crash George? Is it really George Car Crash George? Yes. Yeah. And then George responds uh, to Lightning Rod saying, Crash George? Um, Lightning Rod's response to him again was, I thought I heard the channel describe you as George from the Rich Channel. I thought maybe you might be the George that got crushed in that racing car incident. Uh, no, and then and then George replies, says, Lightning Rod, no, that was Steve Vaughn. He isn't on the channel anymore. Uh, legal and friend issues. Okay. Um, finally, Novlers 53, long live the EV1. Yeah. Yeah. Um, looks like we're starting to wrap up here. Yep. Um, YouTube Highlander, the video team needs a raise. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, have you guys been baiting him? You, you guys <laughs> sending him emails? Thank you for your feedback, Highlander. <laughs> I'll tell you what I need is faster fingers to type. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and then George says, Jesse, hour and a half alarm. Yep. Yeah, he hasn't been waving his hands yet. Uh, YouTube Lightning Rod goes, ah, Yes. And then George says, Jesse needs double team pay for coming in on a holy day. We talk about that, but I give him lots of donuts, so he tends to uh, be okay. That's right. Uh, and then Lightning Rod says, when I watched that episode, I had such a bad feeling about it. Okay, he's talking about that crash then. Yes, yes. Uh, so is that all for the questions, guys? Questions we are comments? all caught up. Okay. Wow. Well, we've got a half agenda here. We'll fold that over into Tuesday next week. We'll continue the discussion. What makes Tesla so unique? What kinds of innovation did they bring to the industry, the auto industry? And uh, our uh, opinions about how they're going to continue to operate in the future. Yeah, fascinating article that we had found on this. So uh, look forward to going through that some more this next Tuesday. It's, today has been a lot of fun like I thought it would be. Yeah. You guys take care very much. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. Uh, for those of you in the States, uh, have a blessed Labor Day as well. And make sure you watch that Monroe video on their podcast channel. Sandy and I are going back and forth and having a great time. We'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you. Take care.